So this evening, it truly is a privilege, a once-in-a-lifetime event, to welcome Dr. Stott to our platform here. Please join me in welcoming him. Sisters and brothers, I thank you very much for the warmth of your welcome. It's uh, wonderful to hear such uh, loud applause. And I would like especially to thank Chancellor Richard Hart for his kind and thoughtful words uh, and two generous words of welcome and introduction. I have known about Loma Linda University and its church for a good many years and uh, it's a particular treat uh, to visit uh, the university personally. And uh, the chancellor was kind enough to drive my assistant and me round, and we were enormously impressed by the quality of the medical work that goes on in this wonderful place. So thank you again for your welcome. Uh, I hope to meet some of you perhaps afterwards. <clears throat> Our God is a missionary God, but the very concept of mission is out of favor in today's pluralistic world, and hostility to it is growing. Pluralism is not just a recognition that there is a plurality of religions and faiths and ideologies, Everybody knows that. Pluralism is itself an ideology. It is the pop ideology of today. Pluralism affirms the independent validity of every religion and denies all claims to uniqueness. Evangelism, that is the attempt to win other people to our opinions, is regarded as incompatible with the spirit of tolerance, an infringement of individual liberty, and a most distasteful form of arrogance. That is what many people are saying around the world today. What right have we, they ask, to intrude into other people's private lives? Let's mind our own business and devoutly hope that they will mind theirs. In other words, leave me alone. Well, how do we respond to this? I want to begin by agreeing that some Christian attitudes and some evangelistic methods could be described as aggressive, arrogant, and even imperialistic. We must acknowledge these failures where they exist, and it calls us to repentance. Nevertheless, we cannot possibly surrender the task of world evangelization. Mission is integral to authentic Christianity. Christianity without mission is Christianity no longer. For we affirm the finality of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has no successors. And we affirm the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He has no competitors and no rival, rivals. Since he is unique, he has universal significance, and he must be made known throughout the world. So we refuse to refer to Jesus the Great. You can talk about Alexander the Great and Napoleon the Great and Charles the Great, but not Jesus the Great. He isn't the Great, he is the only. There is nobody like him. He is unique. But friends, there is something more than that. Christian mission is rooted in the very nature and heart of God himself. The Bible reveals him as a missionary God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who has a missionary vision and who creates a missionary church and is working towards a missionary consummation. So my text tonight is the whole Bible. <laughs> Although I devoutly hope that you will not invite me to read it. 
Seriously, however, it is not really possible to choose a shorter text than that. Because what I want to do tonight is to try and make a brief overview of the whole of Scripture, dividing it into its five main sections. We will look firstly at the Old Testament, at God the Father, the creator of the universe, the covenant God of Israel. Secondly, we will look at the Gospels and at God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Thirdly, we will look at the Acts and at God the Holy Spirit at work in and through the Apostles and the early Church. Fourthly, we will look at the Epistles and at the Christian Church which they depict. And fifthly, we will look at the book of Revelation and at the climax of history which it anticipates. And I think you will note with me that each fresh section is a further missionary disclosure. So let's open our minds and our hearts to this teaching out of the scriptures themselves. Number one, we affirm that the God of the Old Testament is a missionary God. Now this comes as a considerable surprise to many people. They think of the God of the Old Testament as the God of Israel, who chose, redeemed, and then made a covenant with his people. And this is true, but it's only a part of the truth. Because the Old Testament begins not with Abraham, but with Adam. Not with the covenant, but with the creation. Not with the chosen race, but with the human race. And the Old Testament declares that Yahweh, the God of Israel, was no petty tribal godling like Chemosh, the God of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. No, Yahweh is the creator of the universe, the god of the nations, and the lord of all humankind. Crucial to this Old Testament perspective is the call of Abraham, which you remember, I'm sure, is uh, reported in the first verses of Genesis chapter 12. And in this call of Abraham, God promises not only to bless him, but to make him a blessing to others. Not only to bless his family, but through his posterity to bless all the families of the earth. That's the missionary perspective of Abraham's call. So it's no exaggeration to say that Genesis 12 verses 1 to 4 are the most unifying verses in the whole Bible. God's whole purpose is encapsulated in these words, these four verses, namely that God will bless the nations through Christ, the seed of Abraham. And the rest of the Bible is an unfolding of this text. The history of the world is the fulfillment of it. And we ourselves who've gathered here this evening would not be here tonight if it wasn't for this text. You and I are the beneficiaries of a promise made by God to Abraham 4,000 years ago that he would bless the families of the earth through Abraham's seed who is Christ. So I hope that's begun to open our eyes to this majestic vision, this missionary vision that we're given in the Bible. So let's move on secondly. The Christ of the Gospels is a missionary Christ. We all know about David Livingstone, one of the great missionaries in Africa in the middle of the 19th century. David Livingstone wrote in 1850, to his sister Agnes as follows. 
forbid it that we should ever consider the holding of a commission from the King of Kings as a sacrifice, so long as other men esteem the service of an earthly governor an honor. I, says David Livingston, I am a missionary heart and soul. God had an only son, and he was a missionary and a physician. A poor, poor imitation of him I am, but in his service I hope to live, and in it I wish to die. That's David Livingstone. Now, it's perfectly true that twice in the Gospels, Jesus says that his mission would be restricted to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you may perhaps sometimes have puzzled over that restriction. But let me explain that it was a temporary historical limitation. It related only to Jesus' earthly ministry, and he went on to say that through his death and resurrection and ascension and gift of the Holy Spirit, salvation would be offered to the nations to whom he told his people to go as witnesses to the nations. And even the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew's Gospel, I'm sure we all know, is the most Jewish of the four Gospels. Even the Jewish Gospel of Matthew makes this global horizon clear. It begins with the genealogy of Jesus traced to Abraham in order to indicate that God's promise to Abraham is about to be fulfilled. Matthew's Gospel goes on to describe the visit of the Magi, those strange wise men from the East, possibly from the Zoroastrian religion, forerunners and representatives of other Gentiles who later would follow them and do homage to Jesus Christ. Matthew's Gospel includes the saying that many will come from the East and from the West and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. And Matthew's Gospel ends with the claim of the risen Lord that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. And with this commission to go and make disciples of all the nations. So the universal mission of the church springs from the universal authority of Jesus Christ. So are you with me so far? The God of the Old Testament is a missionary God. The Christ of the Gospels is a missionary Christ. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit of the Acts is a missionary spirit. Already during his public ministry, Jesus had taught the missionary nature and ministry of the Holy Spirit. John's Gospel, chapter 7, goes like this, Jesus speaking. If anybody is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water, and this, John says, he spoke of the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given. William Temple, whose name may be known to some of you, was, I think, the most distinguished Archbishop of Canterbury uh, in the 20th century. And he wrote about this uh, particular text. Let me just find it. He commented, he who trusts in Christ not only receives the water of life, but becomes the source of that gift to others. Of that gift. Now listen carefully. No one can possess the Spirit, or no one can be indwelt by the Spirit and keep that Spirit to himself. Where the Spirit is, he flows forth, and if there is no flowing forth, he is not there. The Holy Spirit is a missionary spirit. And so Pentecost 
was an essentially missionary event, and the rest of the book of Acts is an unfolding of that beginning. We watch enthralled as the missionary spirit creates a missionary people and sends them out on their mission. First to the Jews in and around Jerusalem, then to the Samaritans, the halfway house between the Jews and the Gentiles, then to the Gentiles, now through the Apostle Peter, and then through the Apostle Paul, until at last, in the last chapter, Paul reached Rome. A prisoner, awaiting the emperor's pleasure, yet still preaching the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told quite openly and unhindered. So you see in the book of Acts, the gospel spreads from Jerusalem, the capital of Jewry, to Rome, the capital of the world. Roland Allen was a remarkable missionary in northern China at the beginning of the 19th century, and his books are still read decades later. Roland Allen wrote this, the book of the Acts is strictly speaking a missionary book. The conclusion is irresistible that the Holy Spirit who was given on the day of Pentecost was in fact a missionary spirit. This is the great, fundamental, unmistakable teaching of the book. It is in the revelation of the Holy Spirit as the missionary spirit that the Acts stands alone in the New Testament. So the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament was a missionary God, the Christ of the Gospels, a missionary Christ, the Holy Spirit of the Acts, a missionary spirit, and fourthly, the church of the epistles is a missionary church. Too often we think of the church as a club, rather like the local golf club, except that the common interest of its members happens to be God rather than golf. So we pay our subscription, and we are entitled to certain privileges of club membership. And then we forget another word of William Temple, that the church is the only cooperative society in the world which exists for the benefit of its non-members. All other clubs exist for the benefit of their own members, but not the church. The church exists for the benefit of its non-members. We need to remember that because there are many churches that are very self-centered and need to be turned inside out. The 21 letters of the New Testament are all intended, even those that are written to individuals, to build up the church and to secure the growth of the church in both maturity and extent. True, the epistles were addressed to the internal affairs of the church, its doctrine, its worship, its ethics or holiness, and its unity. But they also assume throughout that the church lives in the world and is commanded to reach out to the world in compassionate witness and service. And each local church is to exhibit the missionary character of the whole church. Its members, we're told in Philippians, are to shine like stars in the universe and to hold out to others the word of life. It's rather wonderful, I think, in uh, the first chapter of First Thessalonians that we read, Paul says, our gospel came to you and you received it and it sounded forth from you. Have you ever noticed that? Our gospel came to you and you received it and you passed it on. That is God's way of evangelism. Each church receiving the message and passing it on to others. So that's number four and it brings us to number five. The climax of the revelation, the book of Revelation, is a missionary climax. The Apostle John, in uh, Revelation chapter f uh, 7, sees the redeemed people of God 
standing before the throne of God, a great multitude that no one can number, from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And this prophecy seems clearly to indicate that the missionary task of the church will not be fruitless. On the contrary, it will result in a huge ingathering from the nations. So vast an ingathering, in fact, that it will be actually countless. Only then, at last, God's promise to Abraham with which we began will be completely fulfilled. His spiritual posterity, those who share his faith, will be as numerous as the stars in the night sky and as the grains of sand on every beach of the world. It will be as numerous as the stars and the sand, and it will be an innumerable international redeemed community, the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Now let me recapitulate what we tried to learn from the scripture so far, and then I'd ask you to give me another moment or two in which to conclude. The recapitulation, a rapid biblical over, overview. The God of the Old Testament is a missionary God, for he called one family out in order to bless all the families of the earth. The, God, the Christ of the Gospels is a missionary Christ. He commissioned the church to take the good news to the Gentiles. The spirit of the Acts is a missionary spirit. He drove the church out to witness. The church of the Epistles is a worldwide community committed to mission. And the climax of the Revelation is a countless throng from every nation under heaven. And so, my friends, the religion of the Bible is a missionary religion. And the evidence of this is overwhelming and even irrefutable. Mission cannot be dismissed as a regrettable deviation from religious tolerance or as the recreation of a few essential enthusiasts and maybe fanatics. No, mission lies at the very heart of God himself and therefore of his church. A church without mission is a, is a church no longer because it is contradicting an essential part of its identity. The church is the people of God called out of the world to belong to God and sent back into the world to witness and to serve. Mission is the global outreach of the global people of a global God. That is the horizon of the Bible. <coughs> now two points in conclusion. One, some of us, I don't have the pleasure of knowing more than a few of you personally, but I think I may say without fear of contradiction that some of us may need to repent I wonder, is it possible that some of us have resisted the missionary dimension of the church's life? Have we perhaps even dismissed it rather haughtily as if it were dispensable? Have we patronized it a little reluctantly with a few formal prayers and grudging coins? Have we become trapped in our own narrow-minded <coughs> parochial concerns? If any of those things are true, we need to repent. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you claim to believe in God? He is a missionary God. Do you tell me you're committed to Christ? <coughs> he is a missionary Christ. Do you tell me you're filled with the Holy Spirit? He is a missionary spirit. Do you belong to the church? It's a missionary society. And you hope to go to heaven when you die. It is a heaven into which the fruits of the worldwide mission of the church have been gathered. It's impossible to avoid these things. So secondly, 
All of us need to take action. Some of us may need to repent, but all of us need to take action. For the authentic Christianity of the Bible is not a safe, smug, selfish, comfortable, escapist little religion. On the contrary, the authentic Christianity of the Bible is, a de is deeply disturbing to our sheltered security. It is an explosive and centrifugal force. It pulls us out from our self-absorption and flings us into God's world as his witnesses and his servants. So, we must find ways of expressing this commitment, both locally, in our home, our church, our job, our community, and globally, as we share by diligent prayer and generous giving in God's worldwide mission. Some years ago, I think it was in uh, 1885, William Booth, the great founder of the Salvation Army, <clears throat> was uh, addressing a huge uh, gathering of uh, Salvationists in London. And in the course of his address, he asked these Salvationists a question. He asked them, how wide is the girth of the world? And from the serried ranks of uh, Salvationists came this response. Why, 25,000 miles. In that case, roared Booth with his arms outstretched, we must grow until our arms get right round about it. So friends, may God make us global Christians because he is a global God. Let's pray. Let's remain silent for a few moments, reflecting on what we've been thinking about and asking that God will widen our, our horizons so that we may become truly global Christians who believe in a global God. Let's be quiet just for a few minutes of thought and prayer now. Now perhaps you'd allow me to lead you in a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we worship you as the God of the universe, the God of history, the global God. We ask your forgiveness for times when our vision has been too narrow and our God too small. And we pray that you will so work within us as to open our eyes to see the greatness of your horizons. We commit ourselves and one another to you in the name and for the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.